mighty captain and it's him we shall obey we're on the battlefield for jesus when he souls for christ today oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his So Baptist Church, once again, for the beginning of our Bible conference, we, now we, day number four. Amen? Amen? All right. Let's go ahead and stand as we start day number four, session number 14. As we sing 861, Set My Soul Afire. Hopefully we are all here for the Holy Spirit to set our souls afire for evangelism. Amen? Amen. I know that those two people are excited. How about you guys? Are we here to be... All right, amen. 861, set my soul afire.
Amen. 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 Right after we open in prayer, Brother Cloud will begin session 14 of our conference. I'm going to ask Pastor Timothy Jansen to come up here and open us in prayer. He is the pastor at Capital City Baptist Church in Victoria, Canada, and um, became a friend of ours uh, and of mine when we were on our Belize trip together and uh, enjoyed his fellowship. And um, I was glad he could be here for our conference, and I'm enjoying his fellowship even more. So, Pastor, you open us in prayer. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for your precious word. Lord, may it indeed set our souls afire, Lord, and may you give us a, a passion and a love for souls, Lord, even through this conference. Help us to see people around us the way you do, Lord. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for this church. I thank you for Pastor Lewis. Lord, I thank you uh, for all the speakers. Lord, we pray. Uh, for Brother uh, Cloud, we pray for Brother Whitaker, and we pray for all the speakers tonight and in the next days. Father, would you speak to us? Would you challenge and encourage us? Would you uh, feed us with your word? And uh, Lord, fill us with your spirit. And we pray for your power, and, and through your word, you would change lives. Father, would there be much eternal fruit through this conference? We pray you bless. We pray you protect us. Father, we pray for the Brown family, that you would be with them in a very special way. We thank you so much for loving us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for, for saving my wretched soul, Lord. And, and Father, we pray that you would save many more, and we know you want to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm coming. All right, it's a blessing to see each of you in the house of God this afternoon supporting this Bible conference. And I had a good day today, had a good time in the Word, had a good walk, and I had pneumonia just before I made this trip. The week before, I didn't know if I was going to be able to make this trip. I was on the verge of being in the hospital for the pneumonia, and, uh, but the Lord's given me my strength back, and I'm back to my two-mile walks a day. And a great encouragement, good time in the Word. When I was first saved in 1973, that next day, after I was saved, I became a passionate Bible student. I just loved the Bible immediately. And I had the Strong's Concordance that the man gave me that led me to Christ. And so that Strong's Concordance and the King James Bible he bought me was my library at first. And I just about wore out the Strong's Concordance that first week. I have just had a passion. I got a job working for the Florida Citrus Commission in Lakeland, Florida. That was my first job uh, before I went off to Bible school. And they taught me how to print. I operated the printing equipment. But I just, I, and I did a good job by God's grace. They wanted to keep me when I was ready to go off to Bible college. But uh, I couldn't, all I could think about was the Bible. I just want to study the Bible all the time. And I had a passion for that, and God's allowed me to do that. God's given me freedom to do that. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Amen. And so the subject this afternoon is careful child evangelism. Careful child evangelism. One of the greatest fields of evangelism in the Christian home, is the Christian home. I'm talking about Bible-believing churches. The church is to build strong homes to raise a godly seed. Look at, look at Malachi 2.15. A major verse, Malachi 2.15. As to the purpose of the Christian home. Malachi 2.15 is talking, the context is talking about Israel and how that they were divorcing, and how that they were mistreating their wives, and such things. And in chapter 2, verse 15, 
And did not he make one? Did God not make one? Is that not what marriage is for? Yes. Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? Why did God make that man and woman one? As he did in the first marriage in the Garden of Eden. Why? That he might seek a godly seed. That's why. And even more so today. And we have everything that uh, we need to raise a godly seed if we do what God tells us to do. We've got to have the right kind of churches, and those churches have to build the right kind of homes. That's the way it works. The church builds the home, then the homes build the church. And it all is for the glory of God and His work in this, uh, in this wicked world. All of the major passages regarding the home, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3 and such, they are given to churches. And for the purpose of building up the homes. And so, great mission field. I talked to a pastor some years ago, and he said to me, and all of you would know him if I mentioned his name, and he said to me, I used to believe the children are the future of our church, but now I believe the future is those we reach outside the church. That's what he told me. And, the, and it changed this view because so many of the youth had gone astray. In truth, the future of the church, the church, New Testament church, is both. Should be both. These children running around here that used to be bouncing off the walls, these children, that should be the future of the church. Not till they become teenagers and bail out. But the future of the church, the real future of the church. And uh, if we do right, I'm, sh I'm confident if we do what God tells us to do according to the promises in Scripture, then we can have a stronger next generation than this present generation. Why not? Children can be saved when they're old enough to exercise biblical repentance and saving faith, but they are children and they must be dealt with in much wisdom. The church I grew up in, Baptist Church, probably did not have one saved young person, as far as I know. They were all like me. They all went through the motions of making a profession of faith at some age, 10, 11, 12, and getting baptized and becoming a church member, and then nothing. Just spiritual deadness. Why? No new birth. And nothing was ever emphasized. Your, your, your profession was never questioned in that church. I don't care what you live like, and the fact that you give no evidence whatsoever, and then you go out and live like the devil, was never questioned. On a recent trip, on this trip, I, had, I talked with a 7-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 15-year-old, and a 16-year-old. All of them professed Christ. We're talking in churches. All of them professed Christ. One of these is a pastor's son. But they could not, could not answer basic questions such as, what is sin? What is God's punishment for sin? What did Jesus do on the cross? What is the meaning of baptism? Why did you get baptized? What is born again? What is repentance? Have you repented? How do you know you're saved? Just some basic questions. These are questions we ask. You can't get baptized and join our church without understanding these things. And in these cases, I exhorted the parents to be more careful and to examine their professions. One of the pioneers of child evangelism was Edward Payson Hammond. He was known as the children's evangelist. We're talking about the 1860s and 70s. Edward Payson Hammond. He conducted large meetings in many U.S. cities. And he, those that came forward to the, they call it the anxious bench, to, they signed a covenant card that stated, quote, I, the undersigned, hope I have found Jesus to be my precious Savior. I hope I have. And I promise that with his help to live as his loving child and faithful servant all my life. The convert's name was recorded in a book and the statistics were published. Hammond claimed that 2,000 converts, claimed 2,000 converts in San Francisco and 1,000 in Washington, D.C., and likewise in other cities. 
Over half of those professions were children. Now here's a dialogue that he published between Hammond and a six-year-old during the meeting in San Francisco in March 1875. This is his dialogue with the child. And he's trying to show, this is up on a podium, he's trying to show the congregation how thoroughly he deals with these children. How old are you, my boy? Six, sir. Have you signed the covenant card? Yes, sir. Very respectful. That doesn't mean you're saved. Do you love Jesus? Yes, sir. Why do you love him, dear? Because he first loved me. Were you a great sinner? Yes, sir. And you felt very sorry for your sins? Yes, sir. What sins did you commit? Sir? What, what, what did you do that was so wicked? I forgot, sir. What's he doing? He's, he's just parroting back something he had learned. And then when it comes to me, in my experience, he's lost. What sins did you commit? I forgot, sir. You see, and then he said this. You see, dear children, that the little boy could not remember all his sins. The little boy couldn't remember any of his sins, Mr. Hammond. But by his intelligent answers, Hammond said, he showed that he fully understood the great plan of life. No, he didn't. Absolutely, 100%. He did not. We've got to probe. We've got to dig. We've got to examine biblically everything and not just say, whoo, doggies. Something spiritual is happening. The child's answers showed no such thing. Nothing was said about what Jesus did on the cross, about repentance, about what it means to believe in Jesus for salvation. That's a special kind of believing. The child could not even answer about his own sins. It's a tragedy to deal so carelessly with the souls of children. Amen. Tragedy. Children can be saved if they're old enough to understand the gospel and repent and exercise saving faith in Christ. There's no special kind of salvation for children. They can be saved if they're old enough to be saved. That's it. Now here's some suggestions for dealing with children about salvation. Worked on this for years and years. Modified it, changed it. Yes, this should be our, our, one of our major mission fields, those children. Our church in Nepal is lots of children. And if a church is, has life, it'll have lots of children. And, uh, but we've got to deal with them properly and well. Now, we're just talking about salvation here, but that's the foundation. You've got to be saved. You can't disciple someone who's not saved. Number one, build a strong Christian home. Suggestions for dealing with children about salvation, build a strong Christian home. Because the quality of the home will have a major impact in how the children turn out. The father must be the spiritual head. Ephesians 6, 4. Just a few reminders about the home. Ephesians 6, 4. The father must be the spiritual head. We must, we must work to make the fathers the spiritual head of the home. This doesn't come automatically once you're saved. Now I'm spiritual head of the home. No, it doesn't. And uh, the, it's a church's job to make the fathers the spiritual heads of the home. And work on them. And it's not something that happens one time at an altar. It's a process. In the context of a kind of church that's doing all the things that are necessary for God to work in those fathers' hearts. Ephesians 6, 4. And ye fathers, ye fathers, God says. So God is addressing you fathers. So we better listen up. Provoke not your children to wrath. That's the first thing he says. So it's easy for a father to provoke his children to wrath. The father is told in Colossians uh, not to be bitter against your wife. Why does it say that? Because it's easy for a man to be bitter against his wife. Adam blamed Eve right off. This woman that you gave me. We're sons of Adam. But these things are written because we do these things. That's the first thing it says. Be really careful with your children. It's been said that you can have as many rules as you want laws in your home as long as your love exceeds your rules. 
but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, there's, oh, there's so much there. And so that encompasses the whole package of bringing those children up as a godly seed. And so the father must supervise. That's what it's talking about, to supervise everything. He's an overseer. He knows what's going on. He is not an absentee. He is involved. He makes major decisions with his wife. He controls his schedule and makes sure that he has enough time to do this business. This is big business. Cannot be neglected. And if you're neglecting it, you ask God to show you a way not to neglect it. If it means getting another job. The mother must be the keeper of the home. Now look at two major passages, Titus 2.5. Just a little overview of what we need to have to have these strong kind of godly homes that will raise a godly seed. Titus, these are such beautiful passages and such beautiful words, and they're infinite words, so we keep learning about them. In Titus 2.5 is the mother. Here she is. And so the older women are to teach the younger women to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Beautiful word there. It's the Greek oikoros, which is a combination of oikos. Oikos is home. Huh? Home and oros, which is a keeper. So she's a keeper of the home. Beautiful translation in the King James Bible. It means one who guards the house. Now, it doesn't mean she's just parked there in the home all the time. What's it mean then? It means one who guards the house, one who stays at home, domestically inclined, one who looks after domestic affairs with prudence and care. That's a good one. One who looks after domestic affairs with prudence and care. That's a complete word study Bible. Now, and so she's a keeper at home. Now, 1 Timothy 5.14, it also talks about this aspect of the mother's calling and responsibility. 5.14, 1 Timothy 5.14. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, guide the house. That is a different Greek word, though. It has oikos in it, which is house, but despotes, which means a ruler. A despot, that's a bad ruler. Uh, but despotes is simply a ruler. It's a strong word. It's talking about being a master of the house, a governor, a manager. Now, we know that dad's the actual master of the house, and Christ is the actual master of the house, but under that, the mom is the master of the house, governor, manager. It's the same role that Joseph had under Potiphar. In Genesis 39, 4, he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hands. That's what the husband does with a godly wife. The wife governs the household affairs under her husband's authority and oversight. This is an exalted thing. This is a big thing. This is nothing small. The world mocks this kind of thing and sort of slights it and laughs at it. This is a major, major position. The wife is the guide and keeper of the home. She's the household governor. Proverbs 31, 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household. And the mother and the father must have a godly, wholesome marital relationship. They must work on this. This doesn't just happen. You must work on this and work on this and work on this and never stop working on this. It is, it is essential for the children's sake that the mom and dad have that strong marital relationship. Amen. They're able to work through problems in a godly way, and disagreements and stuff, which do come because the wife doesn't always see things properly. No, that's not right. But neither one of us see things properly. It has been said that the best thing a man can do for his children is to love his wife. We have extensive practical studies on this in the book, Keeping the Kid for the Social Media Age. 
which we taught, preached uh, last year here. And that book and those videos are available online at the Way of Life website. So number one, build a strong Christian home. Number two, discipline the children. Discipline the children. Proverbs 25, 13 and 14. Proverbs 25, 13 and 14. I wish I had done a lot better than this when I was a little, young, a little husband, a little young husband. About the time you figure out what you're supposed to do, you're about dead. Proverbs 25, 13 and 14. What can we do for the children about salvation? Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Deliver his soul from hell is what it says. I wonder what it means. It must mean that if you beat him with the rod in the right way, you'll deliver his soul from hell. Correction. It's the rod of correction. It's not the rod of anger. We can't go into all the aspects of what proper child discipline. But right there, it's the rod of correction, not the rod of anger, frustration. No, but it says, if you use the rod properly, and Proverbs teaches us how to use the rod properly, you'll beat him with the rod. It takes some beating and shall deliver his soul from hell. God's word ties proper discipline of a child directly together with the salvation of that child's soul. Now, the, the Bible definitely does that. What does this mean? It means that the child is under discipline in God's training school. We, we have this little, one of our little boys, he's three years old in our church. Boy, he's all boy, and he just, he doesn't sit down much. And he uh, is not quiet hardly ever unless he's forced to be. He's just a bubbly, energetic little boy. And uh, I've taught his parents a lot. I taught them personally uh, for four weeks in a row about child training. And they'd already been taught a lot. And, uh, but I pray with that father and, and I pray that that little boy will learn his lessons in God's training school. Yeah, prayer, but not just prayer. And so through proper discipline, the child learns the fundamental principles of the gospel. Law, sin, punishment, law and order, the fear of God. Not only that, love and forgiveness. And so in that way, that proper discipline is necessary to, to bring that child to Christ. And so in this light, we can see more clearly why the Bible says... Uh, that the parent who spares the rod and lets the child get away with disobedience and rebellion hates the child. Proverbs 13, 24. Strong language. The Bible has strong language for our benefit. For our benefit. God loves us. That's why he wrote this book. And again, a practical study on child discipline, very thorough practical study, is in the book Keeping the Kids in the Social Media Age. Number three, fill their minds with God's Word. Amen. Absolutely fill their minds, immerse them in God's Word. Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, parents, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Talk of what? The Word of God. Basketball. No, the Word of God. Conservative politics. No, the Word of God. Romance novels. No, the Word of God. Psalms 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The power of the Word of God. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Children are simple. 
giveth understanding unto the simple. 2 Timothy 3, 15, in that, oh, this is, this is so wonderful. Timothy, how'd you get saved, Timothy? And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able, able, the power, this book is able to do things. Able, what? To make thee wise unto salvation. You've got to be wise unto salvation. That brings us back to understanding the gospel properly. Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Boy, there's a lot there. Uh, Pastor Kerry Allen, I've never actually met him, but I liked his book, How Can I Accept Some Man Guide Me, that I read years ago. And he talks of one of his daughters. He said, I began a program of memorizing salvation scriptures with her, rewarding her for her efforts. In less than one month, with numbers of the with numbers of these same scriptures at work in her heart, she fell under deep conviction of sin. Deep conviction of sin. He came to bring, to reprove the world, to bring conviction. It's the work of the Spirit using the Word of God. Start, and so don't wait until they're teens, he says. You've lost them by then. Start memorizing with them as soon as they are able to speak. Surely not later than three to four years old, as soon as they're able to speak. Begin memorizing scriptures. Begin reading the verses to their, your child as soon as they're born. They will hear each verse dozens of times before they even begin memorizing them. And that's a great way to begin the process from the very earliest days. Sow the seed of the Word of God faithfully and consistently every day, and wondrous things will occur. Amen. Yeah, immerse them in the Word of God. There's all kinds of things you can talk about, and they're not un, and, and, and many of them are, are not unholy, but they have no life-changing power. Right. We need to fill up our homes with those things that have life-changing power. Amen. Godly music is another. I, haven't even, I didn't even mention that here. But Pastor Allen published 150 salvation verses that can be used for scripture memorization program for children. And he's posted it online for free. And uh, we have that link in Sowing and Reaping. And we'll also have it in, in an effect, an evangelistic church for the 21st century. And it can also be purchased in print from Bethel Baptist Printing in London, Ontario. Phone number 519-652-2619. Immerse them in the scriptures. Fill their minds with the word of God. Number four, teach them the gospel thoroughly. Thoroughly, teach them the gospel thoroughly. Well, I've taught them the Roman roads. Well, that's not teaching the gospel thoroughly. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16. The gospel is described in a nutshell in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, as we've studied this week. And, and every one of those words is important. Who is Christ? What is sin? What is the scripture? What does it mean that Christ died for my sins? Uh, what does it mean that was, he was buried? What does it mean that he died, a, uh, uh, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures? And the better the parents know the gospel themselves, the better they can teach the children. There should be, there must be, there should be a passion for learning. Not, yeah, I've learned the Romans Road, I got it down. You don't have anything down. Passion for learning all these major things theological terms, but they're beautiful words. They're God's words, infinite words. Pastor Jeremy Johnson, he said of his children, we talk with them about salvation when different topics come up at dinner table, at casual conversation. And uh, he, he goes on here and talks about how he has dealt with his children. Number five, teach them the law of God. Teach them the law of God. All these things are inter intertwined, of course. Uh, Galatians 3.24, the law was given as a schoolmaster to bring men to Christ. We need to use the law. Baptists used to know how to use the law. They used to. But I don't care if Baptists have given up on everything that's right. I don't have to give up on anything that's right. I don't have to follow anybody, not even Baptists. 
have the, have the children memorize the Ten Commandments, at least that much, and teach them the meaning of each one of those laws and how they apply to their lives. There's a lot of stuff there. Old Baptists, they use child catechisms, as I've already mentioned, um, to teach these things point by point. We have a, a chapter on this in our course called God's Law and Evangelism. Number six, deal with repentance. Got to deal with repentance. It is a fundamental of the faith. You can't be saved without repentance. We've preached on that. And, uh, and others have preached on that this week. I tell you, nay, except you repent, you your law likewise perish. Sounds like that child needs to repent. Major teaching of the New Testament. And I can relate to this personally. I, I am looking back, I know that it was repentance that was missing in my life when I was a child. I never doubted that Jesus, never doubted that he died on the cross for my sins. And, uh, but I, I repented. I did not repent until I was 23 years old. Repentance. All children growing up in a Baptist church believe in Jesus. They all do. You're not going to find any little atheist children in a Baptist church. They all believe in Jesus. That's not salvation. The devils believe. They believe that more than most independent Baptists because they tremble. But they're not saved. Repentance, yeah, far more than the average Christian young person in an independent Baptist church. There's certainly no trembling going on fear of God. It's a whole bunch of sports and games with a little shellac of the Bible. That's the South, where I grew up and where I was preaching just before I came here. Uh, people living like the devil, living just exactly as they please, no fear of God, and yet there's this shellac of Jesus over everything. To salve the conscience, I suppose. Repentance does not mean to turn away from sin. It is not reformation. It is not changing your life. It is a change of mind. It results in a change of life. We've dealt with this, and we deal with this in a whole chapter, a whole major part of this course. We've got to teach them about repentance in all kinds of ways, from all kinds of directions. Number seven, don't pressure or manipulate them. Preacher, teacher must be careful not to pressure the children. Very careful. We can do this even when we don't know we're doing this. They're children. They're easily manipulated. God made children to be easily manipulated to, so we can train them, so they can be trainable. They're children. One grandfather told me how he keeps a record of his grandchildren's profession of faith in Christ in a notebook. And uh, he shows it to the other grandchildren. This is where it gets into the problem. He shows it to the other grandchildren and on, on their birthdays, and he said, and he asked, when will I be able to add your name to my book? Granddaddy's little book. Now, he was, he was thinking that's a great thing, and it would encourage me. And I thought, no, that's a lot of pressure on a child's mind. I want to be in granddaddy's book. No, the issue is not whether you're in granddaddy's book. The issue is, are you in God's book? But children, that's a subtle manipulation. Invitations, very dangerous. In regard to children, as far as I'm concerned, extremely dangerous. Just in every way, we need to be measuring, we need to be thinking, we need to be wise, we need to not be following somebody's tradition. Tradition. Measuring everything by the Bible all the time. Number eight, look for the convicting, drawing power of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. One young man asked, one preacher asked me today, looking back over 51 years of salvation, uh, what do I wish I knew more about when I was younger? Well, I, I talked about. I told him about the church. I wish I knew as much as I know now about the church, but uh, the Holy Spirit, more about the Holy Spirit. The convicting, drawing power to the Holy Spirit. 
That's his work. We can't save anybody. You can't save your children. God's got to do it. It's going to be something between God and that child. God made that child. The child's not mine. It's God's. Every soul belongs to God. All souls are mine, God says in Ezekiel. All souls are mine. They're mine, God says. The parent's there. The parent has the privilege to be associated with that child and train that child. But, but that child's soul belongs to God, and he's got to do business with God to be saved. So, salvation is a supernatural work of God. No salvation apart from the Holy Spirit's convicting. John 12, 32. Jesus said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. How does he do that? Here, John 16, 7 through 11 is how he does it. John 16, 7, and the Father and, and, and the Son sent the Holy Spirit, came on the day of Pentecost for this work, among many other works. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. So he's the Comforter, and that's his ministry to the believer. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. I will send him. And when he's come, what's he going to do? He'll reprove the world of sin, and right, of righteousness, and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Ah, the work of the Spirit. That God is God is working, and we have to trust that. We have to understand that. We have, we're, the, we're the laborers together with the Spirit in that work, and, and we are disciplining them and loving them and, and, uh, and, 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 and teaching them the Word of God. But that's all we can do. We stand powerless to change that heart, absolutely 100% powerless. That little girl back there. Nobody in this room can change her heart. Only God. God's ready. God will do it. We, we have great confidence, but nobody but God can do it. You must understand this. The convicting, drawing work of the Holy Spirit and more and more. Number nine. If a child professes faith in Christ, make sure he knows what he's doing. If he professes faith in Christ. So we've come to the point where a child has professed faith in Christ. Well, make sure he knows what he's doing. Don't be hasty to pronounce the child saved and to baptize him. What's the hurry? Well, you say, well, today's the day of salvation. Right. Well, if he's saved, he's saved. Probe. Ask serious questions, such as who is Christ, what is sin, and the questions we've already mentioned, and, and others. And these are the things that a person must know well before we will baptize him in our church. We don't baptize many children, but we baptized a 12-year-old girl last year maybe, but recently. And she's grown up in a Christian home. The mom is a, from Georgia, means not Georgia where they speak weird English, but Georgia over by Russia. And her dad is a, a medical doctor, a Nepali medical doctor. And they got saved in our church. And they have two, a little girl and a little boy and are raising them for Christ. Well, the girl, 12 years old, plays the violin so beautifully. And she's smart. and. And she's no genius or anything, but she's just learned how to study, and she likes to learn. And she sits there right on the front during the preaching and takes notes. And uh, she was ready to be baptized. There was just no doubt about it. This girl's saved. And she can answer any question you throw at her, theological question about salvation. It was really exciting to have her talk to us about her salvation, although we've known her for all her life. 
And if these things are not perfectly clear, wait until they are. If these things are not perfectly clear, wait until they are. Be careful. Be careful. I rec- And so, what do we say? If a child professes faith in Christ, make sure he knows what he's doing. We're going to stop there and complete this, the Lord willing, in the next session. you know that our service doesn't end with the conclusion of today's message. If you ever need anything from Cornerstone Baptist Church, if you need spiritual direction, if you need to more fully understand the doctrine of salvation, if you need uh, a listening ear, we want to let you know that we're here. We hope that you'll personally come and visit our services uh, soon at Cornerstone Baptist Church, but there is a number below that you can call if you need to speak with us. Thank you.